Hello, I'm Jackie Barry, and today I am joined by Lisa Braithwaite, also known as Coach Lisa B, who describes herself on her own website as that slightly weird friend who sometimes embarrasses you in public just by being herself a little too loud or a little too silly. And I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with being silly. And so I am delighted to have a chat with you. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. And it's always nice to talk to Brits because they always know how to pronounce my name. I know that what you do is coach people in public speaking, professional speaking, and your particular expertise is about connecting with the audience. And so that's what we're really going to focus on in our conversation. And my first question is, well, how do you connect with an audience, especially online, and especially now that we're maybe coming out of lockdown a little bit in hybrid events where you've got a mixture of people in the room and perhaps on their computer. So I am a, a strong believer that, you know, the days of uh, the, the one way lecture, those days are over and any speaker, whether you're remote or whether you're hybrid or whether you're in person, your job is to serve the audience. And in order to serve the audience, you have to listen to the audience. You have to engage and interact with the audience. You have to know who the audience is and serve them and give them what they need, want, and care about. So for me, what that means is constantly asking questions. So I'm so the, I use questions in a couple different ways. I use questions for engagement, you know, just to make sure people are paying attention and they're still with me and to get them maybe to uh, flip over from their email or Facebook back to, <laughs> back to what we're talking about. So I use questions that way, just to keep people's attention. And I use questions to find out where my audience is in their understanding and knowledge of what we're talking about. Because a lot of speakers come in and they expect their audience to be kind of an empty vessel and they just wanna pour all their wisdom and brilliance into the audience. I believe in, understanding where the audience is coming from and and also understanding that everyone in my audience is an individual first of all and each of those individuals has a lifetime of knowledge and experience that not only can i learn from i'm always learning as a speaker and a trainer i may be an expert but i'm always learning from my audiences and they can learn from each other as well so that's another way that i use questions i'm constantly asking them questions either yes or no questions. Of course, these are the kinds of things that are really easy to do in the chat. It's really easy to have people raise their hand or use the button in Zoom to show a hand. I mean, there are so many ways to just even use basic questions to get people engaged and to check in with them and find out what they already know so that I'm not treating them like small children who don't know anything. We, I, I don't wanna be, so far above the audience that they're not following me and I don't want to be treating them like they're children. So kind of for me, that's the basis of engagement, um, asking questions and, and having that back and forth dialogue. I shared a whiteboard that had a line across it and at the bottom end of the line was um, a message about, you know, I know nothing about this subject. And at the other end of the line was, I'm a complete expert in this subject. And I got people yes. to annotate along the scale where they thought they were at the beginning of the talk. And it turned out we had people at each end and nobody in the middle. And that ah. meant I could tailor my content accordingly and speak to the experts in a certain way and the beginners in another way and miss out the chunk that would have related to people in the middle. And then that kind of technique works really well because at the end of your session, you can ask again, well, where are you on this scale? And if they've moved along, you've not only got two great screenshots that you can use in your marketing afterwards to say, hey, look at the difference I made in this session. But it's a way of- it. Um, tailoring content based around your audience and not making assumptions about the level of knowledge they already have. So exactly what you were just talking about. Of course, we don't all want to be doing the same thing. If every speaker was doing that exact same opening and close to a session, then it quickly becomes boring and we have to keep innovating, which is where my new book comes in. And you might already know the story of the existing book, the experiential speaking book arose from PSA UK, the, the Professional Speaking Association over here. I was regional president in the southeast corner of the country. 
and I became renowned for audience participation activities. And they said to me, what book do you get your ideas from? And I said, no book, I get them from my own brain. And they said, you must write the book then. So I did. But 2019 wasn't the best time to launch a book of icebreakers, energizers and games mm. that everyone's in the same place at the same time. And the new book is about online engagement. So let's move on to talk about that and maybe Fabulous. share some of your favorite techniques that uh, activities that you use and find most effective. And I am a trainer, so I'm not a keynote speaker. I'm not the person you're going to see on the main stage with, you know, 5,000 people in the audience. I'm the one that's going to come into your company and I'm going to work with 15 people in a boardroom. <laughs> For me, every activity and exercise that I introduce in a training has to be 100% relevant. And it has to move the content forward. So I'm never going to encourage people to do something just because it's fun or entertaining. It always has to be 100% relevant. And another thing that a lot of people don't do when they do exercises and activities, they don't debrief. So this is another thing that's really important for, um, for the audience to understand that if you are going to do some sort of exercises and activities, you always have to debrief at the end, whether that's just asking questions about what people learned or what they got from the activity or have them break into small groups and discuss it. You have to debrief so people actually connect what they did with the learning and they may not actively do that without that debrief and that discussion. So I do very simple things like, for example, role playing, have people break into pairs or small groups and role play a particular scenario. So role plays are something that I do. I also bring toys. Um, so when I'm in person, I might bring Play-Doh or pipe cleaners. And in fact, when I do my own private retreats and my own private um, workshops, I will mail packages to people. So I, uh, you recently did a retreat on micro presentations, which are presentations five to 10 minutes long. And um, I sent everybody a package and the package had the pipe cleaners and the Play-Doh in it in a live group. I've asked people to take three or four pipe cleaners and I get, you know, glittery, fun, colory, colorful ones. I'll say, make something out of your pipe cleaners that represents public speaking to you. And you know, I can have a room full of 15 people and no two people create the same thing. So, so I'll do an activity like that as maybe a, an opening, an icebreaker type of activity with a toy like Play-Doh or pipe cleaners. I might have people write or draw. So again, remote speaking, you can have you can tell people in advance, bring some markers and some paper. I'm going to have you draw things. And you might say, draw something related to X, Y, Z. Um, having people break into groups um, where they where they discuss amongst themselves, they may reflect on a feeling or a thought or an action. Uh, you can have them get up and physically move. Oh, and, and one of my favorite things is to use a prop, which anybody can pick up at any time. And um, th this all started when I was in one of my retreats and I was talking about using analogies in speaking and how to help people understand your, con your concepts by using analogies and metaphors. And I'm really good at this. My book is actually full. It's all, like one big book of metaphors and analogies for uh, engaging, you know, for being engaging with your audience. And um, I'm discussing it. And there was a, a box of Kleenex on the table. And I picked up the box of Kleenex. And I said, for example, if I were going to make an analogy for public speaking, I might say that, you know, this is the part on the surface, the little Kleenex sticking out. This is what the audience sees of you. But everything underneath is your preparation and your practice, right? I just, whatever, I just made up something out of the blue. And now I use that activity a lot in my remote trainings, but instead I use a roll of toilet paper because remember back last year when everybody was like stocking up on toilet paper and you couldn't find it in the stores. When I say to them, think of this roll of toilet paper and how it ties into your topic. How does this roll, you know, how can you make an analogy for your topic from this roll of toilet paper and people you know, somebody said, the more you unroll it, the closer you get to the core. 
I am a very simple person. I use simple activities. I don't like things to be complicated. I don't like to have a lot of rules or instructions. I want everything to be very simple. And if that means I tell people in the room, pick up something on your desk and tell us how this relates to your topic, that's what I'll do. I keep it simple. And I come at this from the position of being a professional copywriter. It's all about how to communicate your message in the written word on screen or on paper. And then as a speaker and trainer, it's how to communicate your message um, through the spoken word in the room or on screen. And then the audience participation activities completely, I completely support what you said earlier about they have to have a point. And in fact, I've been doing yeah. these interviews ever since the 2019 book came out every month and everybody I speak to says the same thing. These only work when they have a point. And the, the thing yes. with ice cream energizers is they have such a bad reputation because so many people do them wrong. They do them because they're being yeah. told, not because they add to the learning outcome. And one thing that adults do not like is something that's frivolous and has no point. We're busy. And one of the things you said that actually hasn't come up that often, but I completely endorse is the idea of the debrief afterwards, because if you don't make it clear why they have to do the thing and then make it easy for them to understand how it relates to whatever the topic is by creating the space for them to have that discussion or, or some kind of follow up, then you're missing a really big trick. So I love the fact that. Yes. You the debrief um, just makes everything so much richer because you you know that people learn best when they process things themselves, right? It's not me telling you why or how or what, it's you processing it in your own mind and doing the critical thinking around the concept that makes you learn it. And again, the debrief is an amazing place as an instructor or trainer to learn from the audience because sometimes they come back and tell you something that you had not even expected, right? So this is a place where you can learn so much for, from your audience and it can make your own workshops and, and trainings so much better when you remember the debrief. But what we're all supposed to do as trainers and speakers and presenters and facilitators is about transfer of knowledge, isn't it? And yet yep. one is teaching and one is learning and it's the learning that, these activities, are, when they're done right, are designed to help. But let me give you just a couple of um, things that resonated for me as you were talking about them. One is the toilet roll. Uh, I did exactly <laughs> what you mentioned earlier on this month, where I said, um, reach for something that tells us something about the topic or, or about you. And someone brought a toilet roll um, and said that his, <laughs> his job was about cleaning up messes. Um, building on what you were saying earlier about doing low tech uh, yeah. activities, they don't depend on people having to click a button or know their way around Zoom or whatever platform you might be using. Yeah. And I just don't want anything to be complicated for my audience because also another thing about exercises and activities is that you should be able to get through them fairly quickly, unless it's a really deep thinking, you know, deep um, kind of activity in a group where people are solving a problem, uh, I want my activities to go fairly quickly so that we can move on and we can keep going and, and that they're engaging and, and again, you know, maybe even fun. <laughs> so I don't want people to have to struggle with technology or instructions. And this is how you keep the energy up as well, isn't it? Keep the pace rattling mm -hmm. along. And one of the things I used to do in training courses when we were all in the same place was these are copywriting courses. So if someone would write something smart, they get a tube of Smarties. If they write something cheesy, they get cheese, a little mini baby bell. <laughs> I love it. The best um, piece of writing of the day, as judged by the people in the room, wins a bottle of champagne. And all that is fine until you're in a room full of vegans because they won't have the chocolate or the cheese and often not the champagne either. So I came up with the idea of kudos cards that are little compliment cards with nice messages, well done and whatever. And they collect a little pile of cards and get competitive about collecting those. I give various little prizes. Um, sometimes the first person to type the right answer into the chat will get a prize. Like I'll, you know, I'll ask a question and whoever gets it right, um, I'll, you know, I'll send them a, a $5 Amazon gift card, right? Something like that. I know people who, who do 
give out really cool little prizes, just fun, like a fun pen that has a big, has a big like faux diamond on the end or for their, for being sparkly or something like that. I have seen people offer some good prizes, but the other thing that I'm hearing is that there's a lot of waste involved in that. It needs to be useful or recyclable. And yep. a one single use plastic is no longer a, a welcome gift. Right. Let, let me just move on then to one final topic, and that's I know you hold qualifications in theatre and in education, and I'm guessing they inform why you recommend what you do. So tell us more about that. Yes, I did start out as a theatre major and then uh, realized that really acting was not, I wasn't really as good as I thought I was, and I'm kind of lazy and I didn't really want to work at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I took my I took my love of theater and went and got a master's degree in education. And I wasn't even sure how I was going to use that degree. I didn't necessarily want to go into teaching because I felt like teaching was too restrictive where you're in one classroom all day every day with the same kids, right? And I I fell into speaking and training and facilitating and coaching through my work in nonprofits. So I started working in nonprofit organizations back in 1992. And I was sent out into the community to do community outreach and to teach and train and you know educate people on all these uh, various causes. My main learning came from teenagers because the majority of the work that I was doing in nonprofits was with young people. And my very first job where I had to speak was going into high schools and talking to high school students about domestic violence. And I very quickly learned that in order to win over teenagers, there are a lot of things you have to do, right? You have to build trust. You have to show respect for them. You have to listen to them. You have to be real and authentic and you can't talk down to them. When you're in theater, you're willing to be, to make mistakes. You're willing to be foolish. You're willing to try a lot of things and you're, you're willing to embarrass yourself. When you're, in, when you're an actor, you have to be willing to let go of all your ego. And that was one of the things that, you know, is really important to me as a presenter. If I make a mistake or if I mess up or do something stupid, it, it just rolls right off of me, you know? And I learn from it if I need to, but otherwise I just keep going. And this is one of the things that I, you know, teach my clients about realness and authenticity. You just have to be willing. You just have to be willing to, be real, make mistakes, take risks, right? And then working with teenagers, I really learned how to connect and engage on that human level. That is my core message. <laughs> stop trying to be perfect. Stop trying to be the smartest person in the room. Stop trying to impress people and just focus on connecting, engaging, and serving. Learned all of that from working with teenagers. Fantastic. And you've shared so much value in this conversation. So thank you for that. You've tied it up in a nice neat bow by taking us back to the thank beginning. You. Because it's not about <laughs> you at the front of the room or the spotless person on the screen sharing everything you know. It is all about getting into their head or what's already in their head and then helping them add to it themselves. Where can people go if they want to find out more about you? My website is coachlisab.com. On, on LinkedIn, I'm Lisa Braithwaite because it's more formal there. But if you look up Coach Lisa B, you'll find me and you'll find my website and, uh, and every other link to everything else is all there. Coach Lisa B, thank you very much. Thank you.